Hello and welcome. I'm Brett Theodos with the Urban Institute. Thanks uh, to you all for joining today's webinar on this important topic. I think that everyone's hearts and minds are focused on small businesses right now in our pandemic moment. And we know how many are struggling. We also know how the federal response has been incomplete. And today we're gonna to spend some time looking more deeply at how we can best support Latino and immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, I wanna start with a special thanks to our partners and funders in this work. We released a report today on this topic with the support from the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders or NALCAB um, and with their support coming from the Kellogg Foundation. Um, so first I wanna start our webinar, uh, the substance of it, and uh, spend a few minutes on a little bit of housekeeping and then we will, we will go in from there just so we get everybody up to speed. So uh, the event's being recorded and we're gonna post the recording online for folks who weren't able to listen or wanna listen again. Speaker biographies are online as well. You are muted as a participant, um, but please type your questions, your comments into the Q&A box. And we have reserved time at the back end to be able to uh, filter those to the panel. Next, I wanted to make a plug for our next webinar. We have some new evidence, uh, quantitative evidence on how small businesses are faring that we're gonna be releasing one year into the pandemic. Uh, so join us uh, at that session on March the 16th. The link is in the chat. So uh, with that, I want to turn it over first to my colleague Jorge Gonzalez, who is going to preview some of the findings from our study, uh, this study, as well as uh, do some framing for us. And then I will come back on and introduce our panel and moderate the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Brett. Uh, hi, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I would like to provide some uh, interesting uh, statistics, uh, a quick overview of some interesting trends that explain, contextualize the moment for Latino and immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Latino uh, and Latinas and immigrants are more likely to be new entrepreneurs. Now the chart that you see in front of you, it shows a rate of new entrepreneurs in 2017. So the numbers that you see on the top of the bars show uh, out of all the people in that category, uh, what percentage started a business in 2017. Now, if we focus on the left side of the chart, we can see that for Asian, black and white folks, uh, that rate is about the same as 0.3%. But if we look at Latino and immigrants, it's uh, considerably higher. Uh, again, what this number is telling us, uh, for the example of uh, Latinos and Latinas, it means that uh, out of all Latinos and Latinas in 2017, 0.5% uh, started a, a business that year, or five in uh, 1,000. Next. Uh, however, that's not always been the case. Uh, this is a result. An uh, an evolution, uh, a positive trend over the years. Uh, and now that we see, what we see is the share of new entrepreneurs is increasingly more diverse. Um, now these two charts that you see uh, show the share of new entrepreneurs is sort of the inverse of the previous graph that you saw. These charts are showing out of the people who started a business on a given year, what percentage of them were Asian or black or Latino, et cetera. Uh, if we focus for a moment on the uh, Latino community, back in 1996, only 10% of, uh, of new entrepreneurs were Latino. But if we fast forward to two decades later, in 2017, that rate has increased to 24%. So what this means is that in 2017, uh, one in every four new entrepreneurs were either Latino or Latina. And there's a similar story here for immigrants. Back in 1996, about 13% of new entrepreneurs were not born in the US. Uh, and two decades later, uh, that rate has increased to almost 30%. Now, something that uh, I wanna uh, highlight here is that, uh, yes, part of this growth is explained by the uh, growth in population and Latinos and immigrants 
uh, making up a larger share of the U.S. population. But actually, the growth in the share of new entrepreneurs has outpaced the population growth. So not only are Latinos and immigrants making up a larger share of the population, but they're also more likely to be entrepreneurs and to start a business. Uh, next. Um, despite these positive trends, uh, we are still facing some challenges. Uh, Latinos are still underrepresented among business owners. Next. So out of every 100 adults in the US, uh, 16 are Latinos. Next. But out of 100 employer firms, and these are the businesses that employ somebody uh, besides just the owner, uh, out of 100 of these firms, only six have a Latino or Latina uh, as owners. Um, and next. Out of every $100 that are produced by these firms, uh, out of those, only about $3 are produced in businesses that are owned by Latinos or Latinas. Now, the takeaway here is that not only do we need to support the Latino community so that they can increase their uh, rates of business ownership and no longer be underrepresented among uh, entrepreneurs, but also that we need to support those businesses that already exist and that, that are going to exist owned by Latinos and Latinas so that they can grow and they can uh, prosper, uh, especially if we think of business ownership uh, as a key to creating wealth and as key to uh, closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, something uh, that is important to note here as well is that uh, the story for immigrants is not the same in this case. Immigrants are actually not underrepresented among business owners, uh, about 17% of the US population was not born in the US and that is about the same rate of employer firms that are, are owned by immigrants. And this is a, a good reminder for us to not to think of uh, Latinos and immigrants as one and the same. Uh, although there are some similarities in, the, in some of the challenges uh, they face uh, in entrepreneurship, uh, there are also two distinct groups. Next. Now, bringing it to the current moment, we know that Latino businesses face elevated risks amid the pandemic, and our panelists are going to talk in more detail about what uh, those risks are, what those uh, aspects uh, that have elevated the risks for Latinos, and, and also you'll see for immigrant businesses. Uh, but for now, I want to focus on one in particular, which is um, concentration in one uh, industry that has been severely affected by the pandemic. Uh, next. So you can see in the bottom right of this chart, um, highlighting the accommodation and food services, we all know that has been severely affected. In this chart, the vertical axis is telling us uh, how many jobs were lost. Uh, in some cases, there, were, uh, there was some job growth over the last year. And then on the horizontal axis, we can see whether that sector is either under or overrepresented among the Latino owned businesses. So for accommodation and food services specifically, uh, we know that 9% of uh, all employer firms in the private sector are in accommodation and food services, but accommodation and food services represents 13% of businesses owned by Latinos. Uh, next. And it's the same story. It's actually even a more pronounced uh, for immigrants. Uh, next. We can also see here how such an outlier is the accommodation and food services in this quadrant. Um, while again, accommodation and food services represents 9% of all employer firms in the private sector, it represents 18% of the businesses owned by immigrants. Uh, now, this is a good reminder uh, for us when we, uh, when we hear or see about uh, the struggles and the difficulties that restaurants and bars and other drinking and eating places face. A lot of these are owned by Latinos, Latinas, and immigrants. Next. And uh, elevated risks have translated into negative outcomes. Uh, businesses owned by people of color and immigrants have been more severely affected during the pandemic. This chart here uh, uses data from uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, shows uh, the change in active business ownership. So businesses that were open and active uh, uh, in April of 2020, so at the height of the lockdown measures, and we can see for white-owned businesses, um, 
only about 17% of these businesses were not active and open at that time. And we contrast that with Latino businesses. Uh, the rate was 34% for Latino businesses and it was 36% for immigrant owned businesses. And also of course, it's very noticeably here how black owned businesses uh, were the faring the worst uh, at the height of, of the pandemic. And this is also a, a lesson on how a lot of the challenges, a lot of the difficulties that we're gonna be talking about with when it comes to Latino and immigrant communities also applies to the black and other uh, brown communities. So the conclusion is uh, we were experiencing important positive trends um, that hopefully the pandemic will uh, not uh, put a definitive stop to, uh, but there were still some, some difficulties. The pandemic has not affected all businesses equally. And as we enter into the economic recovery, as we build back, uh, we need to consider these, uh, uh, we need to take these equity considerations. Uh, when talking about entrepreneurship. Uh, so with that, I hope I've set the stage. I pass it on to you, Brett. Terrific. Thanks so much, Jorge. Uh, and now I want to welcome our panel up to the virtual stage here. We've heard about growth. We've heard about opportunity. We've heard about challenge. Uh, so our panelists that will be speaking uh, from their expertise on this, uh, Aldo Medina, who's uh, the Mercado Programs Director at Hacienda CDC, and we'll get a little more intro to each of them and their work uh, during the panel sessions. Uh, and Catherine Sunt, who's Development Associate at La Cocina, and Storm Talifero, who is Senior Program Manager at Melcat. So welcome to all of you. So much appreciate you joining uh, today. And I, I wanted to start with question. We've seen some data. We've seen some statistics. The data are uh, still emerging in many respects. Uh, they're not keeping pace. Uh, the data collection is it's just not keeping pace with what the pandemic is doing. And so I wanted to start out with uh, just your reflection. And I'm sure many people uh, that are joining this webinar have their own as well. But just your reflection from where you sit on how Latino or immigrant and or immigrant businesses are faring uh, and, and what's unique uh, about the Latino or immigrant business owner experience. Uh, Aldo, let's uh, start with you. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a tough year. I mean, just like everyone knows, you know, I think as I was looking at those statistics, it's, it's capturing February of 2020. Um, and we're in February of 2021. So it's an interesting kind of reflection point. Uh, in terms of how they're faring, I mean, it really depends on who you ask. I think Jorge showed really, you know, our food sector businesses are overrepresented by, by our immigrant and Latinx community. Um, so that's an important one. Uh, a lot of folks are still operating in, in those restaurant industries with the health regulations that are still in place, you know, varying degrees of, of restrictions uh, many have just adopted new business models overall. And so just getting creative, really innovation by necessity is how I kind of refer to it as. Uh, and in terms of just the uniqueness, um, just big shout out. I mean, they're hustlers, you know, we're hustlers. Um, just respecting that hustle, the resiliency, um, you know, making a lot of the grant money work, go to work um, instead of, you know, just closing up shop. Um, but I think the, one of the more unique ones is you know, the, the, the folks that we work with, you know, they take care of their people, right? The employees are not just an employee, right? They're family. And so uh, I've heard a lot of, you know, they were there with us when it was good. And now it's our turn, our turn to be with the employees when times are bad, right? So really figuring out ways to support not only themselves and their livelihood, but also how do they take care of the employees? So I'll leave that there. Great. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure that we'll weave in more of that experience and discussion throughout uh, our time together. So where I wanted to go next, and, and Catherine, maybe you can come in on this one, is we saw uh, recently uh, announcements by the Biden administration on how they're trying to do the current round of PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, differently. 
but there's also only so many things that can be done um, given its structure and design. So I, I'd love for you to walk us back to how you think PPP has worked, succeeded, uh, how it's failed, fallen short. Uh, you know, we're, we're mostly lifting up PPP as the biggest, but we also acknowledge there are other federal sports that came through CARES Act, whether through community development block grant or other tools or uh, idle disaster assistance loan, recovery loans. Um, but Catherine, what, what are your reflections in particular with uh, respect to Latino and immigrant business owners? The PPP um, has been a really big focus for La Cocina throughout the pandemic, um, navigating it for our entrepreneurs and also for La Cocina as an organization. Um, I think one of the first issues that we saw with the first round of PPP um, was just who it was meant for. Um, you know, La Cocina has 74 active businesses throughout the Bay Area and only 25 out of those businesses even applied um, because the rest knew that they wouldn't qualify for forgiveness. Um, you know, the, the first round of PVP only really worked for businesses um, that thought that they would have work for their employees to do. Um, and so it definitely favored larger and better resource businesses um, just because the terms for forgiveness were maintaining uh, the number of employees that you had and also the compensation levels throughout the um, grant period. And we know that I think about 91% is the last statistic I saw of Latinx businesses have no employees beyond the owners. Um, and that's compared to 78% of white owned businesses. So already you have 91% of Latinx businesses that are disqualified from potentially getting for forgiveness for any PPP loan. Um, and then, of course, for the first round, you were not able to apply if you you had uh, if you were undocumented as a business owner. So that are, that you know additionally took out a huge chunk of eligible people. Um, and then for those that were left, for whom the PPP was a good fit, um, the language was just so incredibly convoluted. Um, we at La Cocina we formed a working circle among staff, basically just to keep up with the constantly changing rules and regulations and terms for forgiveness of the PPP. Um, and I mean, that's that's not a resource that most small businesses have. They don't have the luxury of, you know, um, meeting with all of their local organizations to try to figure out the best strategies for applying like we did. Um, and finally, when people were able to apply, the distribution of grants was just extremely inequitable. Um, only 12% of Black and Latinx business owners who applied for the PPP received what they asked for. Thankfully, that percentage was higher among La Cocina because of the support that they had, that our entrepreneurs had from us and from other local organizations. Um, so it, you know, the, the first round didn't go amazingly. Um, it was a huge help for those that were able to receive it, but for most people, it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't an option. Um, so yeah, we were, we were happy to see what the Biden administration announced, um, just a couple of days ago. So I am hopeful that it will be a little bit better this time around, but we'll see how it plays out. Thanks for that and bringing us up to speed there. We know that's an important policy area, um, important policy support or would be policy support. Um, I, I wanna, we're kind of building up incrementally here in terms of institutions. So Storm, we're gonna come to you in, in just a minute, but I actually wanted to go back first to Aldo and to Catherine. And, um, you know, we've heard about the owners. We wanted to start there, um, but now I, I wanna, go up to the organizations that are supporting them. Um, and so could you walk us through, uh, you know, what a community-based organization is, what a business serving or service organization is, you know, what role they fill locally in community uh, and even, you know, what difference you think they might make. Uh, so Aldo, let's start with you. Yeah, for sure, gracias. Este, you know, so Hacienda Community Development Corporation is, is where I work. Um, also owner and operator of the Portland Mercado out in uh, Southeast Portland. Um, and really I like to talk about Hacienda and, and our work in really more of a, an asset building organization and an asset building role. 
Uh, so we build affordable housing, acknowledging that, you know, it starts with the home um, and then providing services to the residents. We do economic uh, opportunity work. So supporting folks with purchasing their first home uh, through the Mercado Empresarios program, we do, you know, small business development. Um, so it's really a wraparound service and, and it's a holistic approach to asset building within, within the Latino community, but, but a larger community in Oregon. Um, and I think, you know, community-based organizations, a, a lot of them are on this call. Um, a lot of folks just let me know that they were on there, but just big shout out. I mean, the, I think the amount of work that came our way specifically was, was incredible, right? I think we also felt a lot of the emotional toll. Um, so big shout out to my team, anyone doing this work, you know, I, I hear you, I feel you, I see you. Um, it's incredibly emotionally heavy work. Um, and, you know, it just keeps, it, it comes in waves, right? And so, uh, but I think, you know, overall, I like to think of it as we're just bridge builders, right? Really building the trust within the community, understanding and really resource navigating. So understanding what programs are at that federal, local, state level, um, and how we can really support the entrepreneurs and, and the folks that we serve uh, on the ground, uh, specifically for Hacienda and just in Oregon. I mean, we supported with everything from, you know, when the PPP came out, we realized that a lot of the folks that we work with were not going to qualify. So we were not going to spend our, our resources or our time on that specific program. So we were able to leverage uh, private money, you know, local money, uh, to be able to inform of like block grants. And so really supporting folks that, you know, didn't really understand what the grant process was, right? It was like, what do you mean this is free? I don't have to give it back, right? What kind of loan terms are on there? Uh, so, you know, just helping folks that aren't necessarily used to filling out a grant application, right? Uh, Hacienda as a whole helped a lot of residents with rent assistance applications. A lot of these, um, you know, forms and documents that are very like government-y, um, so just helping folks understand and navigate a lot of those, uh, you know, luckily in Oregon, the, the state of Oregon provided free PPE for, for small businesses. So we were just a natural fit um, as the Mercado became kind of a, a deep depot center for a lot of the PPE. To this day, I mean, we're still handing out free PPE for small businesses um, and really just serving as a resource, information, sharing, uh, because we're a trusted organization, folks come to us with, with any dudas or any doubts, right? Like, hey, is this legitimate? Hey, is this real? Uh, so I think, you know, serving, I, I can't under, underscore the importance of the, the trust building that we do uh, and really become that bridge. So I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, Catherine, uh, let's go to you. And I love that we have matching plants here in our, uh, in our Zoom. You know, very similar placement here. Um, mine's actually fake. You might not be able to tell. Oh, mine's real. But... <laughs> Um, thanks, Aldo. That was really cool to hear about the work that um, you're doing up in Oregon. Um, so La Cocina, uh, we're based in the Mission District in San Francisco. We're a nonprofit business incubator um, for working class food entrepreneurs. Um, and we focus on women of color and immigrant women. So we initially were founded because we were seeing that working class women of color and immigrant women um, traditionally were experiencing a huge comparative lack of opportunities in the formal job market, including in the formal food service industry. Uh, and these women, um, and at the time we were particularly focusing on um, women who were mainly Mexican immigrants in the Mission District, um, we've now expanded, but they often had informal food businesses, you know, food stalls, um, food trucks, et cetera, that were profitable and allowed them to income patch. Um, but we work with them to formalize their businesses so that they can go from just income patching to asset generation. Uh, and so we have a, a big affordable commercial kitchen space in the Mission District, and we also provide them with technical assistance, um, access to capital and access to market opportunities, You know, connect them with um, farmers market stalls, um, catering gigs and eventually brick and mortar locations if that's something that they're interested in. Um, and so our, our graduates and partic current participants together have about 32 brick and mortar restaurant locations throughout the Bay Area at this point and 74 active businesses altogether. So during COVID, we have really shifted our focus from business incubation um, and focusing on those earlier stage businesses to supporting business survival. Um, 
So, you know, we were before COVID focusing on the about 37 active uh, participants in our incubator program, but now we've encompassed our technical assistance to all 74 active businesses um, because our graduates really were among the hardest hit, you know, being tied to leases and also being responsible for all of their employees. Um, and just to echo what, what Aldo said earlier, I think we've seen the same thing among our entrepreneurs, just like the huge concern for their employees. I think we've seen that no matter how hard hit the individual entrepreneur and their families and their businesses have been, they seem to always prioritize their employees, which has really been inspiring to see. Um, so what, what the support for our entrepreneurs has looked like during COVID um, and kind of the role that we hope that we're playing right now um, was first stemming the bleeding. So we launched an emergency relief fund, um, which we were able to raise over $900,000 for, which we dispersed in direct unrestricted payments to all of our entrepreneurs that needed it. Um, we focused on adapting our technical assistance to COVID times um, and also ensuring that it would encompass all of our graduates in addition to the current participants. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, connecting the entrepreneurs to um, grant and loan opportunities like the PPP and just helping them interpret and actually apply for them. Um, and then we focused on creating new revenue generating opportunities once we felt like we had a better handle on the sort of stemming the initial bleeding. Um, so that's looked like uh, we created a community food box, um, which is basically a assortment of goods from all of our different entrepreneurs that's for sale all throughout the Bay Area. Um, we focus on a lot of food and security efforts as well. Um, so partnering with the city and other organizations um, to provide meals to food insecure individuals. Um, so sort of killing two birds with one stone, you know, providing meals to those that need it while also um, providing income to our entrepreneurs. Um, so that's kind of what we're what we're focusing on right now is just trying to figure out how to get these businesses some sustainable revenue um, while we begin to regenerate post COVID. That's helpful. Yeah, really helpful. Uh, reminder to everyone who's uh, joining us to put your questions in the Q and A box, and we will draw them into the discussion. So Storm, you, from where you sit, you get to see lots of cool examples like the ones that we're hearing about. I wonder if you can help us contextualize them a little bit more and lift up what you see as especially promising strategies for local support or for local action. I've seen a lot of members take the role of translator um, for their small business clients. Um, um, yes, or translator and marketer of um, of the resources that um, um, that are that are publicly available. Uh, so, um, literally translating into to Spanish and and other languages. Um, early guidance on on PPP or perhaps um, a city or, or county um, government's emergency assistance program. We're finding that there. Um, uh, is a bit of a lag uh, between guidance coming out in English uh, versus guidance coming out in Spanish. Um, a number of our groups um, are also um, taking a, a big role in uh, facilitating conversations between small business owners and um, the property owners um, that, um, that they're leasing from, making sure that um, their small business clients are aware of their rights and what the current policies are um, under the pandemic um, for them to be able to, to stay in place or have some um, sort of deferment on their rent. Um, as Catherine mentioned, uh, a number of our uh, members who have a strong concentration of food serving clients um, have done a food box or food subscription services so that they're able to help out multiple clients um, at once. Um, we've also uh, seen groups um, uh, help their businesses execute sales and, and go so far as to, to hire consultants to help them out with their online marketing. 
of their uh, of their products and services, um, even to the point of um, hiring a photographer so that their products are shown in the in the best light, so that they get more hits, more sales, more um, more clients. Um, We've seen groups like Clues in, in St. Paul, Minnesota launch a savings circle program where uh, the savings of entrepreneurs, often ITIN holders who have been ineligible for um, a lot of uh, pandemic aid and assistance, um, where their savings are matched at a two to one ratio. They complete a uh, financial um, capability uh, training program, and then they're able to use that money um, to help launch their business or, or build their business. Um, we've also seen a number of groups really uh, pivot and change their, um, uh, their curriculum for their workshops um, and, and other services, um, building in components on um, disaster resilience, having a disaster plan in place, um, you know, uh, who's going to, uh, you know, who's going to take take phone calls, um, who's going to follow up on the, the security system, really answering those questions ahead of time uh, before disaster strikes. Um, other issues they're also addressing in their curricula, um, supply chain resiliency, and really uh, working with more and more clients to embrace technology. Um, there are still some entrepreneurs out there who are running their business out of a, out of a notebook. Um, I'm not talking about a computer, you know, pen, pen and paper. Um, so getting them, um, getting them online and getting them to embrace technology. Um, so those are some strategies we've seen. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and can you help us um, understand a little bit more how an intermediary like NALCAB um, can support these groups? You know, what is NALCAB? What do you do? Uh, and how? Is that function helpful? We've heard about how the CBOs or the BSOs support the entrepreneurs, and how are you supporting these CBOs? All right. Um, so uh, NOCAP supports our um, our network of more than um, a hundred nonprofits um, that work in um, uh, a diversity of, of communities to help their clients build assets whether that's through small business ownership and entrepreneurship, affordable housing um, and, uh, or financial capability. Um, so uh, our members do one or, um, or some combination of, of those three. Uh, and so what, what we do, uh, how we support our members is we uh, support them through grants, training, technical assistance. And um, last couple of years, we've become a CDFI. So um, we're also able to provide further capital assistance. Um, but NALCAB uh, you know, is an intermediary. Uh, we don't deal with uh, small businesses directly, typically. We support our members uh, to, um, to improve and grow and strengthen their services because they are the, the anchors um, in their in their communities, so in, you know at, at NALCAB we say juntos somos más, together we're stronger. Um, I think for intermediaries it's really important to stay in close contact with um, your members and you know listening and being reactive to their needs. We knew uh, early on in this pandemic that. Um, Latino and immigrant communities were, you know, really uh, struggling with accessing PPP, and uh, we were able to uh, partner with CDC um, Small Business uh, of California to refer uh, to have our members refer their clients who are struggling to get PPP loans uh, to CDC Small Business. Um, so if uh, so if our members weren't able to, to make a PPP loan or to, uh, their clients were struggling, um, we were able to establish that relationship. And so we really encourage organizations um, to not try to go it alone. Um, you know, if, um, uh, if your clients are, are having trouble accessing uh, PPP, reach out, reach out to your, your local CDFI 
reach out to, to the lenders that you know and see if you can um, establish a, a referral relationship. Uh, we're now doing that with um, uh, in this, this latest uh, uh, version of, of PPP. We're working with um, uh, Lift Fund um, through several states and um, Opportunity Fund to refer our clients, small businesses, um, to those uh, to those funders uh, to get those applications filed. Um, we also, um, you know, encourage other intermediaries to take a holistic approach when um, when considering uh, support for uh, for local organizations. Um, you know, don't don't consider the organization in a, in a vacuum. Uh, consider um, equitable neighborhood development as a policy. Look at incorporating tools for anticipating um, and analyzing neighborhood change. Um, uh, look at the socioeconomic uh, data, the demographic data, housing, um, uh, you know, uh, housing rates, increases um, uh, in um, increases in, in rental rates, increases. Um, and well, and rather the, the lack of housing affordability. So look at the trends that are impacting um, those organizations. Um, also, so we've you know we've listened to our to our members, and uh, another thing that intermediaries and, and funders could do is is try to to give these groups some grace, if at all possible. Um, try to move towards longer grants, longer funding periods, two to three year grants, maybe even just 18 months. These small organizations spend a substantial amount of time in researching, um, researching, finding out about um, funding opportunities, applying for them, and then doing the reporting. Um, we are we are in a pandemic, and so to the greatest extent possible, we've uh, tried to lengthen um, the period of those grants so that our members have more time to work with um, small businesses and do the the work that they're best set out uh, to do. Our limitations, of course, are uh, are from our funders, um, and we encourage them also to uh, take a longer term outlook when people are uh, dealing with a pandemic that is going to last longer than a year. Great, yes. Uh, <laughs> I think there were several amens to that. So uh, thank you, Storm, for lifting up all of those uh, examples. Uh, and thanks to Gregory Johnson, you asked my next question for me. So I'll, uh, I'll put your wording to it, but I was going there as well. I want to talk about policy considerations, uh, especially as we move beyond PPP. Uh, he lifts up CRA reform, which we know is happening, maybe happening, is happening, um, but also other spaces. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, federal policy, and even if you want to draw in state policy or local policy, the enabling environment, the funding, the resources, the regulatory tools, there's so much that goes into policy, um, more than just money, as important as money is. Um, so although let's start with you for this question. What do you see as the needs uh, in the realm of policy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, also just Going back, Storm, y'all, uh, NowCab, by the way, has the NowCab uh, Pete Garcia Fellowship. And so I'm a graduate of that, so big shout out. Uh, I think leadership development in some of these small, you know, smaller nonprofits is, is super important uh, and super valuable and, you know, just establishing networks throughout the nation. Uh, so big plug and shout out to my, to my fellowship class of 2019. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of policy, we have a really important role and a really important opportunity um, to avoid the going back to normal, right? Because normal pre-pandemic didn't work for our communities, right? So as we're crafting policies, as we're looking at these things, we'd really need to have opportunities where we can do things differently, right? I think the, the pandemic exacerbated a lot of the inequities we already knew. Um, but I think, you know, one real concrete thing that I know that the state of Oregon is doing, you know, is just passing a bill through uh, accessible uh, capital, right? Like access to affordable capital. 
um, using the same kind of regulations and the same uh, pieces to understand someone's risk eligibility, right? Um, it doesn't work. And so if we're getting to the, to the core and getting to the need of the people that need some of this affordable access to capital, uh, we really need to do things differently, right? Whether that's, you know, figuring out the debt calculation, credit, um, you know, the leverage factors. So really understanding how we can do things differently um, as, we, as we move into what this recovery will look like, right? Um, at the, you know, so that's at the state level for, for Oregon. Um, so I'll stop there. I'll pass it on to whoever yeah. like. It strikes me there's, there's so much that can and, and, and should be and needs to be done, uh, whether it's from making SBA look different. Uh, and, and SBA is not the only uh, federal source of support for entrepreneurs, you know, we've got revolving loan funds through USDA, through EDA, uh, and more. Um, Jorge and I uh, did an interesting piece looking at Chicago, and uh, we can put that chat in, uh, link in the chat uh, of a model where um, it, it was able to combine, the city was able to combine resources um, in the form of grants, and then in the form of CDFI loans that were able to come together, that these um, business owners were um, risky enough that CDFIs were not willing to come in. But when combining a grant capital, perhaps 50% of, of a project, they were able to come in. So there really are new and emerging models out there where policy can step in and provide a deeper level of support for entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs of color, um, that initiative was focused on commercial corridors of interest to the city, um, but I think we need to we need to look beyond the federal guarantee as our only tool in uh, our um, you know quiver, the only arrow in our quiver, a tool in our tool belt uh, to be able to support entrepreneurs and and to overcome some of the disparities that we've been hearing about. Catherine, you wanted to lift up. Uh, something in the realm of policy as well. What, what do you think is important for us to understand there? Um, well, I don't have too many specific policy recommendations. I think the number one thing that, thing that our entrepreneurs um, and the industry needs right now is direct financial support. So however that can get to them, that's a policy that I support. Um, I think one Thing that has become even clearer um, throughout the pandemic that we've always needed, particularly uh, restaurant workers have always needed, is um, a social safety net, you know, universal health care and universal child care. Um, and actually, I, I think that the our emergency relief fund, which I had mentioned before, which was a monthly unrestricted disbursement to all of our entrepreneurs, both participants and graduates um, that applied for it. Everyone was qualified. Um, I think that that was kind of an interesting pilot in a universal basic income. Um, and we, there's actually a, a mayor of Stockton near San Francisco who has been doing something similar for the last couple of years. So that's, a, that's another story. But I think that what we saw from that was just that it really allowed for a lot more innovation um, and creativity among the businesses um, because they, they weren't so worried about you know, putting food on their table um, taking care of their families and paying their personal rents. You know, they were able to actually focus a little bit on their businesses during that time um, and, you know, collaborate with other businesses, um, figure out new ways to do takeout and delivery so that they didn't have to completely put their businesses on pause during the pandemic. Um, so I think that that has been, it's been clear to me that 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 seems to work, you know, just giving giving people a little bit of that that safety net so that they can be more innovative. Great. And next shout out to uh, Lisa Shaala, if I'm pronouncing the, your last name right, uh, who previewed where I was going to go with our next question, uh, which is exploring more the role that philanthropy can play in supporting your organizations or in supporting entrepreneurs directly. And in particular, Lisa was interested whether you've been able to collaborate with community foundations 
in your areas. Um, but if you would build that out as well as the role of uh, philanthropy in general, um, whoever wants to start us off. Well, NALCAP is a national organization. And um, so uh, um, there, you know, we were typically collaborating with other uh, national funders. Um, but we do have some more regional funders like the, the Northwest Area Foundation. So perhaps I'll, I'll leave it to, to Catherine and Aldo to, um, you know, better describe how they work with community uh, foundations. But I, you know, I can add that um, for um, uh, foundations and, and corporations to um, better support Latino and immigrant entrepreneurs um, is to really, you know, uh, focus your, your funding on the people that, that best serve those most impacted um, uh, by, uh, by the pandemic. So in the, the CARES Act, um, you know, it included $240 million of funding for, for SBDCs, um, but SBDCs are not always the, the best conduit for assistance to minority uh, business owners. Only 28% of their uh, clients are are you know uh, some for uh, some form of minority? So you know technical assistance you know must be made directly to nonprofit networks, community-based organizations, and CDFIs. Um, and to further support CDFIs um, and small businesses, um, you know we'd like to see uh, greater support for loan guarantee programs, um, so that lenders uh, can can continue to, to take, take risk and absorb uh, some of the losses that are, are going to be unavoidable um, in a market downturn. Um, also, uh, you know, we just encourage funders to also um, reach out and, and do uh, an, a higher level of balance sheet support um, in the form of, you know, loan loss reserve support. So, um, so that these nonprofits can better support these small businesses, uh, in addition to looking at a longer time frame for funding to support these groups through the pandemic and through the recovery. I can I can kind of touch in. Um, so thank you for all that. I think one of the really important things that I do want to highlight is the important, and I'll go back a little bit to the to the policy piece, but also tie it with the with the philanthropy in that, you know, the immigration issue at the national level is impacting our communities greatly, right? And I think we need to understand and acknowledge the fact that immigration policy as we move forward and through this pandemic, through this recovery, like immigrants are, are entrepreneurs that are putting into our tax system, right? And they're not necessarily, they're not getting the return on those tax dollars. So I think in terms of policy, going back to that, I mean, immigration is huge, right? Because that's taking away a lot of the opportunities from the entrepreneurs that are that are hustling, right? The solopreneurs that were that we were referring to earlier. Uh, and in terms of just philanthropy, you know, just appreciating the flexibility, the understanding, uh, you know, the the funding really. Uh, there was a big bulk of money that came through the through the CARES Act, right? That had to be spent down by December 31st. Right, so really working with our with our funding partners to be flexible and extend that those grant periods a little further past the the CARES Act money because that was going to run out, right? Um, and so, yeah, just appreciating them. I mean, the the piece that Storm said about you know just being graceful with some of the reporting, uh, and I, you know the reason is not just because we don't want to do reporting, right? I think it's important to also acknowledge that. The work that we do, and earlier I mentioned about building trust, like that takes time, right? And those things are not something that I can just deliver something on. And so um, I just want to highlight that piece. But and then you know, just like I mentioned earlier, like a Peak Garcia Fellowship, big plug there. Just continued development of of our community and our community leaders, right? Um, so I'll pass it on. Great, Catherine, did you want to add here? Um, and then I want to draw in some of the questions we're getting to come in. 
Yeah, um, I think Storm and Aldo covered it pretty well. Um, so thank you both for those comments. Longer grant terms, all for it. Um, that was that was one of the things that I had in the back of my mind. Um, I think ultimately it just kind of comes down to trust. We really are asking for our funders to trust us to you know set our own our own goals and objectives um, and priorities and and trust. The, the, our clients as well. I think the same thing goes for La Cocina and our clients. You know, we need to make decisions alongside our clients the same way that funders should be making decisions alongside us. Um, and I think the same thing goes for policy. You know, um, I think as long as we are listening to the voices of the people that we are supposedly trying to serve, then everything should go well. Um, so I think it's all about just kind of lifting up the voices of, of everyone. Um, but great, thank you. Um, so many good questions. I'm going to try to filter them, and we'll try to try to answer them in rapid lightning uh, fashion. One storm. I don't know if you have a link uh, you can put in the chat, but uh, Lisa wanted more information on the St. Paul example uh, that you spoke to. If there's a website or something to put there, I'll get that. Uh, right there. And then um, another question, and I don't. I, you guys are the people in your communities, but for people who aren't in your communities, is there some um, website or resource where people can go to find organizations like yours? Uh, somebody's hoping for, um, you know, uh, Ivana is hoping for some links, whether it's to a CDFI or a BSO, business service organization. Yeah, you can go to the uh, NALCAB website and look at our list of, of members um, by state and find groups that, um, that serve your community. Um, you can go to the Treasury, uh, the Treasury's website um, for the, the CDFI fund to search and look for uh, CDFIs in your community. Um, there, there are a lot of great groups out there. And it may be also possible to start with uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce or other um, local group uh, that may have good linkages. Um, even a local bank might know who the technical assistance and coaching providers are locally and, and might be able to make a linkage um, to include the small business development centers um, and, and others. Great, so one question that we got was how can, uh, how can we help groups overcome the digital divide for entrepreneurs? Um, and uh, then Alex also added in a question, um, how can his nonprofit, uh, digital marketing nonprofit better collaborate with you all? Um, so what, uh, talk to us quickly about digital divide and how we get I mean, quick, like it's a lot, right? We have a few seconds, I think. Um, it's a big question to tackle, but I mean, leveraging existing technologies, but really just giving people computers and helping them with digital literacy. I mean, Hacienda was able to, you know, leverage our partnerships uh, to be able to just buy in bulk quality computers and then just give them out and provide, you know, digital, uh, digital coaching on that digital marketing piece. Uh, we did, you know, just quickly through a grant, we were able to have a like a pop-up studio, photo studio. Um, and so we did a little, you know, a couple square feet in our office. Folks can come in with a product or food and they could just take a picture, upload it. So creating, supporting digital content creation. Because a lot of folks are doing, I mean, you all know this, right? Like folks are doing this with their phone, right? Like they're on their phone on a Zoom call. They're on their phone trying to upload something. So, you know, leveraging the tools. And then just reaching out, building collections, uh, bridge building, connecting, you know, ensuring that at the end of the day, the entrepreneur is the one that's going to be benefiting and not necessarily the organization or, or something like that. So centering them. Great. Um, so uh, a last word from each of you. We did get a question or a comment from uh, Michael Kelly saying, um, we seem to be focusing more on uh, commercial um, and on uh, uh, you know, retail type businesses, but what about uh, manufacturing um, and other industrial type 
Um, and sorry, that's from, uh, not from, but the other one, different comment from Mike. This is from Lily. Um, uh, what about manufacturing industrial? And, and maybe that's who you see that we're lifting up those stories a little more, or um, you can bring it in there. Um, and uh, the other comment you may want to speak to in your last words is, is the technical preparation that's needed uh, to help people with uh, financial statements and others. So I guess just to close out is, you know, you could kind of land on what gives you hope or also where do we need to go from here? We've got, we've got a lot of work to do as well. So I'll let you each have a final word. I can, <laughs> I'll go and this is the next time I'll really uh, shut up. But I think, you know, as a result of, of the pandemic, it's just advocacy is something that's just kind of come to the top of my list. And it's more of a necessity uh, and a calling to have a voice of the people that aren't in the room and the folks that are most affected. Um, and I'll just echo again what I said, you know, we, we can't go back to normal. We have a really unique opportunity right now in this moment in time um, where some of the advocacy is happening, you know, virtually. So uh, getting in there, speaking up, you know, having your voice heard and, and speaking up for the folks that don't have a voice, um, we really need to change how we did things. And, uh, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to do that. So thank you all so much. Um, I completely agree, Aldo, and echo the fact that this, you know, we could make this a big opportunity to change the system and make it better than it was before. You know, the food industry in particular was was nowhere close to equitable. Um, and we've already seen that. I mean, um, I've been super inspired by a lot of our entrepreneurs. One of them took the opportunity to um, turn her restaurant into a completely worker owned operation during the pandemic. So that's in process right now. Um, and we're seeing a lot of really unique and super interesting innovation come out of this. So obviously it's a bad time for everyone, um, but I'm hoping that we can turn it into something better coming out of it. Yeah, I have, um, I have a lot of hope um, in, in terms of uh, business serving organizations um, and intermediaries um, partnering together to um, to really lift up and build the small business ecosystems at the local level. They're building um, referral systems, uh, centralized loan application systems. So, you know, I have the feeling that things are, are going to, to get better, um, but I do think we need to um, continue to uh, to recognize the, the, the least fortunate, those with the, the least assets um, and the, the least amount of support, um, including um, uh, ITIN holders, Latinos, um, African-Americans, um, and helping them face the, the challenges and, and limited with the limited resources that they have in terms of funding um, and from a funder's perspective, to really try to be open-minded, not just about the, the length of grants, but also, you know, what, what are you funding specifically? Are, are you letting nonprofits um, purchase technology like, like Zoom or um, giving them the, the, the freedom to, to, uh, uh, to, to purchase computers or notebook computers to loan out to, to small businesses to bridge that digital divide? Um, and if there, um, I know we haven't addressed all the questions. I wish we had more time, but um, encourage um, folks to to reach out to, to any of us directly, and um, we'd be happy to answer your question or or point you in the right direction if we don't have the answer. Terrific. So I'll uh, I'll I'll echo and amplify that, uh, and just encourage everybody who we didn't get to to reach out to uh, the most logical panelist. Thanks to. Uh, the Urban Events team for helping us pull this together. Thanks to Nalkov and to Kellogg for supporting the work. Check out the report online. Thanks to Jane and Jorge for co-authoring it and Jorge for presenting. And thanks especially to Catherine Storm and Aldo for joining as panelists and lifting up your expertise and wisdom in this as well. So be well, everyone. Uh, take care and be in touch. Thank you, Thank you everyone.